Okay, everyone, I hope you are following the instructions of wherever you happen to be. Um, in Michigan now, we're supposed to shelter in place, which just means we're going to become hermits, but that's okay. We're lucky there's still plenty of fun things to do, like listen to lecture. So um, just a quick update, though. I do think we're going to postpone the exam for a week just to uh, give me a chance to grade your quizzes and give you guys the feedback, because that way if I do... You'll know if you make any mistakes before you take the exam. So let's reschedule the exam for April 3rd. I'm sorry if this causes issues, but once again, you'll have plenty of time to take it. And as always, if you need something, just let me know. Okay? So uh, the way the class is structured now is we're going to sort of branch out into three different directions. So today we're talking about the phylum chordata, which this is one we're all familiar with because this includes humans and other vertebrates. And then the class will branch off a bit, and next time we'll talk about the plants, which of course are actually my favorite group. And then the time after that, we will talk about the arthropods, so just to give you a heads up. Okay, so just a reminder that all chordates are deuterostomes, okay? And in order to be considered a, a member of the phylum chordata, you have to have all four characteristics that we will discuss in the next slide at any point in time, okay? The thing to consider, though, is that... Um, uh, we tend to think of the chordates the most because, once again, this is where we are at. Now, in order to be a member of the phylum chordata, you must have all of the following features at some point in life, okay? So, many of these features, especially in humans, are only found in the embryo, but they do go away over time. Perfect example of this are pharyngeal slits, okay? So, the pharyngeal slits um, are a series of openings that connect the inside of the throat to the outside, Okay, so they're not always, but very often used as gills. What's called a dorsal nerve cord. Okay, so the dorsal nerve cord, it's a bundle of fibers that runs down the back, connects the brain with the lateral muscles. So in vertebrates, the dorsal hollow nerve cord eventually um, is what is our spinal cord. Okay, and then uh, the third thing is a notochord. Have I mentioned you should write this down? Because you're going to see this again. <laughs> so is a notochord. Okay, and so that's a rod that runs underneath and supports the nerve cord. All right, um, this appears in all vertebrate embryos, but it no longer functions in body support and movement. Okay, just to have an idea. And then last but not least, we have what's called the post-anal tail. So this is an extension of the body past the anal opening. If you've ever broken your tailbone, you know exactly how uncomfortable that is, and that's what this happens to be, and that's why we fit into this particular group. So when it comes to the relationships of who's related to who in this particular phylum, what I want you to realize is that it's not completely resolved, and it depends on what data that you use. If you'll recall, when we were talking about trees before, we talked about how you put them together, and sometimes the molecular data doesn't match the other data that's used, and this is definitely um, a good example of that. So tree A, and you don't have to memorize these, just be able to read it. Um, it's sort of the classic textbook view where you start out simpler and then you get more complex. But once scientists started to actually incorporate some molecular evidence, they started to get other trees like B and C, okay? And then you start to realize that things are not as simple as they might have seemed. The other thing I want you to get from this is, first of all, we're the vertebrates, okay? So the hemichordates, those critters are like the C acorns and so forth. They're relatively simple. The urochordates, those are, guys, those are the little guys like the tunicates or the sea squirts. Those guys are actually really cool. And then the cephalochordates, those would be like the lancets. Now, I don't know if you guys remember a long time ago when I first started to teach you how to put trees together. Um, and we used a lancet as the outgroup. So if you go back and think about that, then once again, everything ties together. So the whole idea as far as how the vertebrates came about is that we all came from fish, okay? And so you'll see this in the video that you hopefully watched before you started lecture and also in the video that I'm going to have you guys watch after lecture, okay? So we had the common ancestor that we shared with the cephalochordates and the idea is that we were an offshoot, okay? Some of the earliest vertebrates, uh, one example is Pykaea and those are found in the Burgess Shale. If you guys remember the Burgess Shale, that's where... Um, we found many, there were many awesome other fossils there, Anomalocaris and so forth. Um, and the Pikea was a relatively simple looking guy, looked like a simple fish, okay, but they didn't have a whole lot of complexity back then. But then later on, the Hykoelas would come about and you could see that they look a little bit different, 
Okay, and in fact, they have a little bit further evolution of a head or a skull where you really start can see that they start looking like primitive fish. Now, we've said this before, and we'll say this again, that some of the most interesting research is when scientists challenge each other to figure out exactly how early a particular group evolved. And a later discovery um, actually is pretty interesting. It came from China, uh, where scientists found what looked to be even earlier fish that came about 50 million years earlier before the Haikuela and the other fish, which would be about 530 million years ago. And if you look at the fossils, you can see that these guys definitely look, you know, like fish and similar to what the others look like. And what's interesting is that this suggests that um, during the Cambrian period, evolution was moving incredibly quickly and much faster than anybody predicted and this was probably due to the Hox genes also probably due to um, you know interactions between different species and the race between the predators and prey but it's interesting to figure out when these guys actually did evolve and all the traits that came with them so we know that vertebrates are characterized by having a vertebral column okay so we start to wonder why did the vertebral column actually evolve and so it seems probable that the notochord one of the characteristics of the chordates evolved as a structure that helped in swimming but eventually um, body sizes get to be so big that the notochord doesn't have enough stiffness to actually protect all those nerves and so forth and so most likely in order to increase efficiency, a backbone, you know, a vertebral column made of calcium what evolved to sort of help stiffen and give the support that all of those nerves need. Now, I can tell you from personal experience, if you've ever pinched a nerve in your back, you are <laughs> really, really miserable. And um, I can tell you, I honestly, I was wishing for death. <laughs> and so, um, you know, having that area protected is incredibly important. And if any time there's a vulnerability, it's, you know, the, in the spine or anything along those lines, well, let's just say it's really easy to see why, um, you know, that, needs, that area needs to be protected. So the time period we're dealing with now is called the Ordovician period. And so it's between 510 to 439 million years ago. Hint, hint, write this on your timelines, okay? And so during this time period, the jawless fish became much more abundant and diversified and this means they don't have a jaw okay and there are two different groups of fish that happen to fit into there and we will talk about them in the next couple slides and then eventually the jawed fish will come along as the lampreys okay and I gotta tell you these guys have a face only a mother could love so um, the way they eke out a living and they are parasitic as you can see um, the picture on the right that's what their face looks like doesn't it look really interesting those are all tiny little teeth okay and the way it works is that those guys will attach to another fish and you can see it in the picture on the left and then they will burrow into the side of the fish okay where they will start sucking out blood and juice and everything else they can get um, you know it's it's kind of a gross way to make a living but honestly it works for them they're definitely considered a, a problematic species if you have fish that have too many of them unfortunately the fish could potentially die and so, um, you know, them being around is, is definitely not a good thing for the other fish. Now, the other jawless fishes have all gone extinct, okay? So, um, they are collectively referred to as the ostracoderms, okay, or ostracoderms. I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways. So, what's interesting about them is that they have a really extensive exoskeleton, Okay, and endoskeleton. So they lived in the early Ordovician, so we're talking about 480 million years ago to the late Devonian, which is about 370 million years ago. Okay, so the phylogenetic relationships or the trees of these different groups has been debated, and of course, you can imagine why, because these guys are all extinct and so they don't have any living relatives to figure out who's related to who. But I believe both of the videos I'm going to suggest to you guys um, shows example of these, and don't they look cool? 
okay? You can see though that they definitely have a hard um, protection on the front and most like the purpose of that of course is to protect against predators and so forth. Um, they definitely are an interesting group of fish but you can imagine that having so much armor and protection would be really heavy and take a lot of energy. Okay, so remember there's always a trade-off somewhere. Now, the hypothesis is that an ostracoderm ancestor gave rise to the jawed fish, okay? So, the next slide we're going to talk about the jawed fish, and their group is called the Nathostomata. Eventually, what would happen is that the jawless vertebrates would decline, okay, and the jawed fish would really begin to thrive about 380 million years ago. Hint, hint, write that on your timeline, okay? So you might be asking yourself, how did the jaw evolve and why did the jaw evolve? And I would say, aha, that's an excellent question. So the current hypothesis is that the jaw came from gill arches that were originally used to help the fish breathe, okay? So um, by supporting this, taking those gill arches and having it go towards the jaw, eventually what would happen, it would be easier for fish then to take in water because they open their mouth and the water shoots in. And then as they close their mouth, the water shoots out the gills. Okay, but it's an added benefit to be able to have a jaw, as you can see for many different reasons. Think about how awful life would be if we didn't have jaws. Okay, it helps us eat our food. Um, it could be potentially be used for protection. So there's definitely a lot of benefits to having jaws, and you can see why this would basically just take off from an evolutionary perspective. So jaws have an obvious benefit, okay, to being able to defend yourself as a fish and additionally being able to breathe um, by bringing water in and then being able to eat your food, okay, so jaws definitely, you know, provide a lot of benefits. Now, as far as the where jaws would appear in the ancestral fish, it would be the placoderms and the acanthodians, the otherwise known as the spiny sharks. So on the tree that you see there, wherever you see the two little pluses, those were jaws where the jaws would appear in the older fish first. Eventually they would appear everywhere because jaws, of course, are really useful. So let's talk about the placoderms. These guys are really interesting. And someday, when we're allowed back on campus and we're allowed to go to the museum again, they have a really awesome placoderm uh, display in there. So the thing I want you to remember about these guys is placoderm is, um, the name placoderm is from Greek and it means tablet and skin. And so this refers to the bony plates. Okay, so now these guys look a lot like the ostracoderms, which are jawless, remember? However, you can tell these guys in particular because they have paired fins and jaws. Okay, so this is what gave them such an advantage over the jawless cousins that they had. And they could bite solid food rather than having to only suck things up from the mud. Okay, so even considering this though, what I want you to realize is they're still relatively primitive when you compare them to other fish, okay? So the fourth pair of gill arches isn't really um, a great support for the jaw yet, okay? And so the backbone is still a notochord. And so they're still relatively primitive. However, they look so cool, don't they? The other thing I'd like you to know about the placoderms, by the way, is they evolved into having all sorts of different body types, otherwise known as ecomorphs. And so some of them were torpedo-shaped swimmers, some of them were flattened bottom dwellers, okay, some of them were carnivores, some were detritivores, in other words, they consume dead stuff. And so these guys, um, you know, they did really well and they flourished. And so, you know, at one point in time, um, from a macroevolutionary perspective, they did quite well. However, eventually they would all die out and not be successful in the end. Now, the next group of fish that I would like to talk about appeared about 419 million years ago or so. Okay, these are the Acanthodians, and so they were around the same time as the Placoderms. Um, they both have well-developed lateral fins, and what I want you to think about with that is when you have lateral fins, you can control your body position in the water much better. And so you might be asking yourself, well, why does body position matter? And I would say, aha, excellent question. So the reason body position matters is if you, you know, let's say you have a predator and you want to go up really quickly to try and escape it, or if you want to sink really quickly and try to escape it, you know, that's what those lateral fins definitely help with. 
So the Ancantharians are thought to be ancestors of the bony fish, okay, so known as the Osteichthys, and we'll talk about them soon. However, um, they are named the spiny sharks, but that's not a very good name for them because from all the fossil evidence suggests that they arose in fresh waters, and as we all know, sharks live in salt water. Now, of our jawed vertebrates and our bony fish, there are approximately 25,000 species. These guys are doing incredibly well. So they're found in marine environments, they're found in um, freshwater environments, okay? And of those, there's two different groups. There's what are known as the lobe-finned fish and the ray-finned fish, okay? So the lobed-finned fish, those, by the way, are our ancestors, and we'll talk about those in the next couple of slides. The ray-finned fish are the fish that we tend to know and love today that we, you know, think of in our tanks and so forth. And so these guys have definitely done incredibly well with regards to an evolutionary perspective. Now, of the fish with jaws, okay, we have one group which is known as the sarcopterans. These are the lobe fin fish, okay, um, and what is so interesting about them is they actually have a humerus and a femur and the same very similar bones as we do in our limbs, which is actually pretty cool. So that's one cool thing about them. A second cool thing is that some of them fall into the group of lungfish and guys, they have lungs. I mean, how interesting is that? Okay, so you might be asking yourself, why would lungs be useful? Well, if they happen to live in a pool that is only going to be filled with water, you know, for so long, it's known as a temporary or seasonal pool, and having lungs lets them go find another one if their first pool dries up. Okay, we also have the coelacanths in this particular group, and the coelacanths are known as a living fossil. All right, and so last but not least, we have the Ripidistians, and these are pretty interesting because it's hypothesized that they are the possible ancestors of the first amphibian. So all of these guys are really interesting and have a lot to contribute to the evolutionary record. Now again, why we find these guys interesting is because they have limbs with bones very similar to ours, so it's hypothesized that they are our ancestors. However, as far as diversity goes, they were probably the most diverse back in the mid to late Devonian, and since then they decline because really there's only those three groups left. So from an evolutionary perspective, they're definitely not doing as well as they once were. You know, they definitely had their time though. And again, you know, being our ancestors, they're pretty interesting. Now the ray fin fish tend to be the fish we think of when we think of the fish. And so um, unlike the lobe fin fish, their fins are actually supported by thin, long rays of endoskeletal bone, okay? So their um, limbs are not even remotely as similar to ours. However, from an evolutionary perspective, they've done incredibly well. They have about 25,000 identified species. They're doing, you know, really well. Um, you know, they tend to rival tetrapods with regards to diversity. So, but what I want you to get from this is the fact that their bone structure is different. Okay, they do have, they fit into the jaw groups and so forth though. And so they are considered evolutionarily advanced and they're doing quite well. So, as I said before, um, when it comes to the ray fin fish, their rins are, uh, sorry, their fins are supported by long fin rays of endoskeletal bone and you can see that in the drawing of the fin of the perch okay then you look at the lungfish you can see they're much more sturdy and then you look at the ripidistians you can see how they have a radius or a humerus and same bones that we do okay so um, they definitely from a structural perspective are very different but again they do quite well from an evolutionary perspective now what I like about this figure is it does a really nice job to summarize who came about when and when they were the most abundant. So the jawless fish you can see came all the way back at the end of the Cambrian and remember that would be the earliest fish that we're talking about and what I want you to think about with regards to is what did they look like, how big were they, by the way they were small, okay. Very simple, not complex at all, but you know when you're starting out that's the way it's going to be. Then we had the placoderms come about and they really had their heyday with the jawless fish back in the Devonian, okay. Then we would have the Encanthodians would come about as with the sharks then eventually we would get our lobe fins in there, and then the ray fin fish, which would just take off and do incredibly well, as would the tetrapods by the end of the Devonian too. Okay, so um, this is the end of the lecture, but then what I would like you guys to do is listen to the, and watch the um, 
uh, YouTube video that I've uploaded for you because I thought it did a, just a really nice job to kind of summarize fish evolution because it's kind of kind of hard to keep everything straight. What I would also like you guys to do is basically use the information I've given you and add this to your timeline. Okay, who came about when? What characteristics did they have? Hint, hint. You're going to see this again. Okay, so um, you know, sort of write down all that information. And of course, if you have any questions, let me know. And I will do my best to get Wednesday's lecture uploaded on time. Have a great day.